they didn't want to see a second mine go in because they were aware of uh, the pollution that could happen from the mine. The four of them created the Friends of Strathcona Park and they um, engaged the help of other wilderness organizations such as the Valhalla, uh, Valhalla Wilderness Organization because at the time a number of environmental groups were springing up all over BC to protest these various things. I'm, I'm looking across the water and across Quadra Island to the mountains on the mainland and that really took me back to where I was born and raised in the English Lake District. I was raised right on the edge of the biggest of all of the lakes so water was right in my front yard and uh, I looked across the water to mountains uh, which were completely gorgeous. Uh, the idea of a, a mine opening in the English Lake District uh, would absolutely horrify just about everybody in that entire area. And for the government to allow it to go ahead here uh, was just plain wrong, quite honestly, in my opinion. But I, I tried to sort of ease off on expressing that uh, too much. Uh, I, I tried to sort of give a fairly level-headed uh, opinion on the thing. The whole thing with the Friends of Strathcona Park happened. I had already been with the newspaper for about 11 years. I was pretty well known in the area because the paper did actually have a pretty hefty turnover. To be honest, I don't really remember precisely how I came to be very well aware of uh, the, the mine in the park, uh, Myra Falls Mine. In, in those days, it was Westman Resources. Because I was covering the environment and all that kind of stuff, uh, it slowly began to filter through to me that, oh yeah, there's stuff around here that really needs to have some serious attention paid to it. I, I became pretty well aware that none of this had to be any darn good for, uh, for the environment and for people's health. a lot of stuff about acid mine drainage and how uh, they were increasing the size of the tailings pond up at uh, Myra Falls and that was all draining down into Buttle Lake which is at the top end of uh, the drinking water supply system and the whole water supply system. The conversation around acid rock drainage has been ongoing. Um, if you talk to an environmental engineer, they're going to tell you that the safest place for it is actually in a lake because no oxygen can get to it. You sort of think of, it's a very sensitive topic. You think, okay, we've got this pristine lake and you're suddenly you're dumping this stuff in it. But the dichotomy there is that while it sounds like it's better to Put, it, put that material that you think is you know, filthy and polluting up on the land, in a, in a pile on the land, by putting it on the pile on the land, you're actually creating acid rock drainage because it's now exposed to an unlimited supply of oxygen. And if you've also got a lot of rain, which Vancouver Island has plenty of, you've actually got a, a perfect, perfect situation to create uh, to dissolve all that uh, puritite or pyrite that's in the rock and then dissolve all the other sulfide minerals that are left and produce solutions that are rich in copper, zinc and, and iron and, and highly acidic and have those now flow into 
um, the lake, the same lake that you thought you were polluting by putting the material directly into. So eventually what they decided to do, when they found out that drilling had begun, they blockaded the road so that the machinery from Cream Silver couldn't go into the park. What did annoy me, and I think annoyed a lot of people, they we sort of titled a part of the park as a recreation area. Well, it was nothing whatsoever to do with recreation. I mean, it was all industry, right? So. I mean, that was just a plain, deliberately misleading misnomer, and totally wrong. Eventually, about uh, a thousand people became members of the Friends of Strathcona Park, but at least a couple of hundred ended up to these blockades. I take my hat off to those people. It was pretty inevitable that in the end, a bunch of them were going to get themselves arrested and literally carried away if necessary. When they were told they were being arrested, some of them just said, OK, you're going to have to carry me away. and that, they just went limp, and then, of course, I had to bring in more police officers to take people away. <laughs> a number of them were arrested, but they were never charged. I, I think some of the police officers may even have uh, kind of sympathized with some of the protesters uh, for the stance that they were taking. We're prepared to give you bail to let you go, but only on the condition that you give an absolute undertaking uh, that you will not go out and do this again. But the important thing is that finally um, the Ministry of Environment that governs that and, and BC Parks realized that they needed to allow the public to have some input into what was being said. And they set up a committee, people were able to tell their side of the story, what their opinion was. And um, finally, they concluded, um, they said, well, you know, people don't want this to happen, and it's time for us to listen to the people. And they also decided at this time, by this time it was about 1990, that it was time to write a master plan, because there never had been one, even for this huge old park. Um, so by 93, they had a master plan in place, and it stated, no new industry in the park, the park is set aside for recreational purposes. And this, this was a milestone in the history of the park. It was really important. And it started with those four people. <laughs>